Okay, I want to tell you a little bit about phosphoglycerides or phospholipids. So glyceride here should make you think of glycerol right off the bat. And this kind of goes back to our discussion on fats, our lipids in general. So phospholipids, remember lipids are anything that are made up of like a glycerol and three fatty acids. That gives you a triglyceride. Phosphoglycerides are going to still have this glycerol backbone. Right, this is our glycerol here. And then the type of chemistry is going to be the same. It's all going to be around these alcohol groups. Um, but instead of being all fatty acids, we'll still have two out of three of them are going to react with fatty acid chain. Okay, so we'll have two of them. But on the third one here, this third one, instead of reacting with a fatty acid, this third one is actually going to be joined by an ester linkage. So this is going to be a phosphate ester. Okay, and this phosphate ester linkage is going to be um, linked then to this alcohol, to the glycerol, and on the other side of it is going to be an amino alcohol. So when you put this all together, then it's going to look something like this here. So here's our phospholipid, again the phospho referring to the phosphoric acid that we are reacting with. or the phosphate group that kind of ends up right here, and that's this one, this guy. Uh -huh. So we could have any of the fatty acid chains here. They do a dehydration reaction, so we get rid of our water molecules. That does this linkage here, like we've seen before. And then what we have on the bottom one, the different part of that makes phospholipids unique, is the phosphate group that's formed with this phosphate ester linkage. And then on the other side, it is linked with an amino alcohol. So the amino here should make you think nitrogen right off the bat, right? Like our, an amine group. And then the alcohol, of course, is your hydroxyl group. So we're going to have some combination of those, and I want to give you some common amino alcohols. So if we look at these amino alcohols, and there's three of them that I want to talk about today. Um, there's more than this, but these are kind of the three important ones for the molecules we'll be studying. So we have choline, C-H-O-L-I-N-E, choline, and here's our alcohol side of things. There's our hydroxyl group, and then we have an amine group, but it's actually not an amine group, it's a pneumonium group. So here's our alcohol, and here's an ammonium, because it has three of these methyl groups on our nitrogen. So our nitrogen then has a resulting plus charge, just like our ammonium side of things. So that's choline. Serine looks like this. So we have our alcohol group on this side. And we have, again, an ammonium over here. So the way I've drawn it here, we have kind of this side that has the positive ammonium cation on it, the alcohol on the other side. And you can see that from this chain, I have um, a carboxylate ion as well. But if you look at this serine, and maybe you recognize the name, you've seen it before. If I was to rearrange it and draw it in a different way, more like this, then you might recognize it as what it is, which is an amino acid. So it's one of our 20 amino acids that make up proteins. And usually we draw them like this with our ammonium on one side, our carboxylate on the other. This is my alpha carbon, right? And then my alpha carbon has my R group sticking off of it here, which for the case of serine is a CH2OH, okay? So it allows for things like hydrogen bonding and all sorts of things because of that R group. And this is your alpha carbon. Okay, so um, these are the same molecule. This is the same serine. Um, it's also an amino alcohol because it has the alcohol group there on the end as part of its R group, okay? So we'll talk about it in a little more detail. The other amino alcohol that I want you to know is ethanolamine, ethanolamine. Ethanol, the eth means we have two carbons, of course. The ol ending means that it's an alcohol, so here's my alcohol group. 
and then my one two carbons that's my f prefix and then it's actually um it should be more appropriately titled ethanol ammonium right because we have an ammonium cation over here but this is the way that they just structure it so this is ethanolamine so any of these three choline serine and ethanolamine can be on that other side of the phosphate group for these uh, phosphoglycerides or phospholipids and there's a couple different classes of them depending on what amino alcohol they're attached to so there's two major classes and the first one are called lecithins so here's class number one lecithins and le lecithins are phospholipids or these phosphoglycerides with a choline on the end so we have our 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 groups whatever these fatty acid chains are it doesn't really matter we have the phosphate group here and then attached to it we have choline so this is our choline Okay. And if you look at the charges on this thing, we have kind of a negative charge down here, we have a positive charge over here, so this whole part of the molecule is pretty hydrophilic. Whereas this part of my molecule, even though these are polar bonds, because they're sandwiched in between the glycerol backbone and our fatty acids, this is going to be a relatively nonpolar part of the molecule or a hydrophobic part. So this should start to make you think a little bit about soap molecules, for instance, where we have one side that's hydrophilic, one side that's hydrophobic, and the type of chemistry that these lecithins can do is very similar because of it. Lecithins are important for the transport of lipids in the blood. Um, our blood is primarily based in um, water more than anything else. We're basically water organisms. Uh, so it's important to be able to interact with both water and lipids. So the hydrophobic tails in our fatty acids here can interact with the lipids. And this side can interact with our blood, which allows for things to move around. So that's important. It's also used as an emulsifying agent, as are anything, any molecules that have a hydrophilic end and a hydrophobic end. And because of that, they will also form micelles. So think of our, our soap molecules again. So if we wanted to kind of stylize this thing, so here's what it looks like in terms of the chemistry. If we wanted to stylize that, then here would be our long hydrocarbon chains. Here's my polar end, so kind of a polar head if you want to think about it that way, and nonpolar tails. Or we could kind of think about it like this, because this polar head is sort of free to move around in 360 degrees. So if I moved this thing around, it would look something like this. So you will often see phospholipids drawn in this way. And we'll get to that when we talk a little bit more about cell membranes. So these are lecithins. Lecithins are the ones with choline in them specifically. There's another class of our phospholipids, and they are called cephalins. And the prefix ceph should make you think of your head, um, so cephalic, anything to deal with your head or your brain. These are your second class of, of your phospholipids here, these cephalins. So these are phospholipids with either that ethanolamine or the serine, either one. So those are the other two of the amino alcohols that I mentioned before. And because of this prefix, again, the prefix sort of indicating brain or head, Um, these occur mostly in brain tissue, so this is really important in terms of our nervous system and, and our brains in general. They're also used as emulsifying agents, they have a similar structure, and they're important in blood clotting. And the reason that lecithins and cephalins are both incredibly important is because of their roles in membranes. So eukaryotic cells have a cell membrane. Okay, we know that because it's different than plant cells, for instance, which have cell walls as well as cell membranes. And cell membranes kind of serve two different functions. So eukaryotic cells or animal cells, or us, you know. <laughs> so two functions for these cell membranes. They are selectively permeable, which means that they can allow some things in but not others. 
and that allows for osmosis so we can move water around pretty easily through these cell membranes and this is especially important for the external membrane in the cell because you know a cell looks like this it's basically a bag of fluid right and it has a membrane on the outside and we have to allow for some exchange back and forth between the fluids and the other stuff that is in there and within the cell itself there's all the organelles you know we have our Golgi apparatus and mitochondria and you know ribosomes and here's your nucleus and all sorts of other things that are inside the cell and so for those internal pieces those internal organelles then we can also have internal membranes and they are important as well And in the same way that lipids protect our organs, so we have a layer of fats around our organs in order to protect them, there are these compartments and internal membranes within our cells that protect um, the individual organelles, okay, and keep them from, keep them safe, I guess. Now there's a way that we can model these membranes. So these cell membranes, of course, are important for a number of different reasons, um, primarily because of those functions, and they just keep the stuff that needs to be in cells in cells and keep stuff that shouldn't be in cells out of cells. So these are just incredibly important for all parts of our life. And our membranes themselves are made up of about a 60-40 ratio of lipids to proteins. So we have a lot of lipids in there embedded into our our membranes and that's kind of an important piece to what makes them up and we've talked a lot about proteins now too and the proteins make up about 40 percent of membranes and they allow for a lot of different things in the functions that we've discussed before and the model that we used to talk about cell membranes is called the fluid mosaic model so a mosaic if you think about an art piece is a um, usually quite large and made up of teeny tiny pieces um, that are all kind of movable around. So you can use tiny pieces of tile or stone and all of these things together make a larger picture. That's a mosaic. And the fluid part means that these components can actually move around. Um, so let's say tiny pieces making bigger picture. And with the fluid part, it means that they're mobile. Which is kind of weird to think about. It's weird to think about something that helps to hold things in or hold things together as being able to move around and be fluid, but it's actually an important piece to our cell membranes. And these proteins, the 40% of the proteins that are making up our membranes here are embedded into kind of a flexible lipid bilayer, and we call it a phospholipid bilayer relating to our phospholipids that we're talking about here. So there's phospholipids, there are other lipids in there, and we'll talk about that in a second, but the phospholipid bilayer looks something like this, and again, this is very stylized, but if you relate this back to our chemical structure that we looked at before, we have these hydrophilic polar heads, which would be open to the water or aqueous environment on the outside, so kind of water on the outside, water on the inside, and these charged heads are hydrophilic and really are all about that. And on the inside we have these hydrophobic tails, so we have a non-polar hydrophobic environment in here. So there, here's our phospholipid bilayer. So these are our phospholipids, again, kind of stylized. Um, they're basically forming what is sort of like a micelle. Um, they're at least forming a little passageway here where we have a non-polar environment on the inside and an aqueous environment on the outside. So they orient themselves in such a way because of these intermolecular forces that like likes to be with like in terms of non-polar versus polar, that they look something like this. And then in each of these phospholipid bilayers embedded within them are different proteins. And some of these proteins go all the way across. Some of them are what are called transmembrane. They go all the way across. Some of them are just kind of sticking to the surface and provide other sorts of um, roles and functions. Um, the way that I've drawn these proteins here, they're both transmembrane. Here's another protein. 
and the protein itself will also orient itself. We know that the R groups allow for some parts of it to be hydrophobic and some parts to be hydrophilic, so that tertiary structure of proteins, it'll bend and rearrange and move itself, and so the hydrophobic bits will be in the middle in this hydrophobic environment, and the parts that are hydrophilic, that are interested in interacting with water, will be at the ends, and that allows for them to orient themselves in such a way to where they can be on both sides or all the way through these membranes. Now these proteins, as part of this fluid mosaic model, these proteins can move laterally within the structure. So it means that these proteins are going to be kind of dancing along. They can move to where they need to move and they'll move back. And these phospholipids are going to kind of get out of the way and shift around and rearrange and move themselves. And so these things are always kind of moving to get where they need to go to do the functions that they need to do. And we kind of just trust that this happens. There's so many points in our body where things could break down, but this just is happening all the time um, without any input from us. Um, you'll also see that I tried to draw here a cholesterol molecule. So this is another lipid that's embedded in the, the phospholipid bilayer. Um, this is cholesterol, one of our steroids. Um, and we said that cholesterol is an important part of our cell membranes. And so that would just, I'm just trying to show that in there as part of our fluid mosaic model. There's many things that are embedded in these membranes, many types of lipids um, that make them up as well as our proteins. Your book has kind of a poetic way of talking about it. It says that proteins float like icebergs in a sea of lipids. And I think that's just kind of poetic to talk about the way that these things are moving around in order to get to the places that they need to get to. Okay, so that's phospholipids and kind of their importance in the body. And if you have any questions on that, please don't hesitate to ask.